Um, brethren, it's a privilege to be here. We bring you the love of your brethren in Muhammad, Illinois, particularly Brother Daniel and Sister Judy McClugan. Our title, as announced, is um, The Conditions Universal and Beyond Human Power to Regulate. We've added the title, The Conflict Irrepressible. This title, <clears throat> The Conflict Irrepressible, is the title of a chapter in the fourth volume that includes many quotes of the troubling trends in Brother Russell's day. Our subject has two aspects. First, it is a universal conflict that spans the whole world. Second, there is no human effort that can prevent this conflict, which ends with the collapse of human society. These two aspects are addressed in the fourth volume, pages 381 to 384, and also in reprint 5413. But both of these concepts, universal conditions and beyond human power to regulate, both are discussed throughout the fourth volume. God's general purpose in permitting this irrepressible is that the coming trouble will end Satan's rule of selfishness and introduce Christ's kingdom. Dear brethren, the past 150 years, the world has experienced both a time of great achievement and hope, but also a time of horrific wars and unprecedented destruction. There has never been such a time and the conflict continues to progress in our day. Now, the world sees these tremendous changes, but does not understand their meaning. The worldly wise recognize that human history has taken a different and unprecedented course from the French Revolution, which marks the beginning of the time of the end, but especially since 1914, the worldly wise recognize that mankind has entered an unprecedented time of insecurity and fear. We are living in this transition time when Christ's kingdom is coming in and it is displacing Satan's realm. Galatians 6 7 tells us, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Galatians 6 verse 7 expresses the principle of divine retribution. God has established principles of right and wrong, the violation of which brings trouble and sorrow to mankind. God's ways are ways that bring blessing and happiness when followed. These principles of right and wrong bring their harvests of good and evil in due time. Speaking of the time of trouble, Hosea 8.7 refers to this same principle of divine retribution, quoting, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind, unquote. Human society has sown to the wind for more than 6,000 years. Much evil and sorrow have resulted, but the full harvest of this evil sowing has yet to be gathered. I see reprint 1653. And we planned a couple of handouts for the presentation. These provide an overview to the fourth volume lessons under the illustration of a trial. You may have noticed that Brother Russell organized the fourth volume as a trial with testimony given, the accused trying to defend themselves, and in the end, a verdict and restitution being made. The drawing that you see identifies the actors in this trial. God is the judge. Jesus is the prosecutor. Earth's institutions are the defendants. And the world of mankind is the jury. In this trial, the judge does not need to be convinced of the verdict. It is the jury that must be convinced 
and who in the end carry out the final sentence. In this irrepressible conflict, the trial has to continue until the final verdict is reached and carried out. Dear translators, I'm going to add a comment here. Um, dear friends, as you look at this, the fourth volume has been difficult for many of the brethren because of all of the historical quotes. The reason we have all of those quotes is this point about testimony. Brother Russell saw in his day the institutions of earth trying to explain what was happening, trying to justify themselves. We have had much testimony Brother in the Russell, time since uh, World War I. My computer has been TikTok. Please give me one. So returning to um, my written thoughts. Hello. Yes. Um, I'm brother Miro. Did I need to do something different? No, it's okay, brother John. Continue. Okay, thank it's you. Okay. In the fourth volume on page 527, quoting, so complex and peculiar will be the conflict of this day of vengeance that no one symbol could describe it. In the scriptures, accordingly, many forceful symbols are used, such as battle, earthquake, fire, storm, tempest, and flood. How do we explain the great extremes of good and bad that man has experienced in the last century? Looking at human history as a whole, we are living in the most unique time of all in just every way. The historians, economists, and other thinkers recognize this is a tremendous period of upheaval and change, unprecedented in human history. Okay, good. Going on then to, this is slide seven, Brother Daniel. Again, why is this hard to understand? Two aspects of this transition period. We now live in a time when man is examining the fruitage of human history, all of human systems and endeavors, to see to what extent those have benefited the human condition. None have overcome Adamic sin. We see that the systems of earth have greatly changed. Brother Daniel, I'm going to jump down to um, the second paragraph here on slide seven. Brother John, I'm sorry, yes. my, my uh, laptop has been restarted. And I need just one minute to be put uh, set as a translator. No problem. Uh, We're thankful other, you're there to translate. Well, uh, for the last two minutes, I haven't uh, been translating because my, my laptop has been uh, restarted. Uh, brother, uh, I don't know who, Brother Igor. You are now, Daniel. I see you are in translator now. Brother Daniel, just let me know when you're ready to proceed. Uh, I can continue, Daniel. Okay, you, brother, sister. brother John, you, you can continue now. Yes, brother John. Thank you. Oh, I can continue. Maybe it will take longer than we expect. <laughs> well, dear friends, just to recap Raj, on this, Raj. there are two aspects of the transition period, both judgment and restitution. We see with restitution, restoration, God prepared man's place and position in the earth to be paradise and perfection as a king in harmony with nature. The rights of man have become a concern in the earth such as they never were before. Mankind at the present time is not being restored individually to the place that Adam had, but there is a general restitution of the human condition, which is preparing and pointing toward all that Adam enjoyed 
in the garden. In a sense, restitution ideas about man's rights are becoming general in the earth. Mankind is unwilling to settle for the former dominance of the few over the many and expects that all should have a share in the bounty of the earth. This general restitution relates to the blowing of the jubilee trumpet and coincides with the harvest period and this period of general judgment. The prophet Isaiah referred to both general restitution and judgment in Isaiah 40. I'll read verses 3 through 5. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Commenting just a moment, every valley being exalted, the lifting up generally of mankind is that general restitution. Every hill being made low, the institutions of the earth, those things which set up some over others, those are being made low. This is all preparation uh, for that mediation in the kingdom. Returning to the slides. Brother Russell identifies a key scriptural point early in the fourth volume that this judgment has the two parts. The judgment has two parts, one a judgment of the human system and the other the judgment of individuals. The common thought of judgment day is that it's for individuals. Quoting fourth volume, page 12, the judgment of the world as individuals will be distinct from its judgment as nations. The judgment of nations now instituted is a judgment of men in their collective religious and civil capacities. Quoting further, that the dark and gloomy day thus described by the prophets is a day of judgment upon mankind socially and nationally, a day of national recompenses, is clear from many scriptures. The judgment of the world as individuals will be distinct from its judgment as nations. Why must this general aspect of judgment and restitution precede the individual judgment and restitution? First, removing the governments and institutions of earth prepare the way for individual judgment. The governments, financial, religious, and social systems are all part of Satan's kingdom of this world his control mechanisms over society so he can maintain his dominion over man. Second point, with the greatest knowledge and material and social improvements in human life, all parts of this general restitution, <clears throat> God is allowing the man's governments and institutions to try to improve human society. The past 150 years have been a laboratory in which mankind could throw off the old governments and try new governments like communist Russia, Nazi Germany, or new, excuse me, economic systems such as socialism. God is allowing mankind to do this under the most favorable conditions possible while man is still under sin. Going to the next slide. On screen, we have a picture from 1989 when many young Chinese people protested their government in Tiananmen Square. The government sent tanks to disperse the protests, but one man standing and refusing to move caused the tanks to stop. Quoting page 12 in volume four again. Let the reader bear in mind the difference between national judgment and individual judgment. While the nation is composed of individuals, and individuals are largely responsible for the courses of nations and must and do suffer 
greatly in the calamities which befall them. Adding a, a comment here. Those of you who know the history of China realize the protesters in this initially succeeded, but the government clamped down and individuals suffered greatly in that clamp down of um, repression from the government. In Revelation 20, excuse me, 19 and 20, we find several successive pictures of judgment. We see our Lord as the one faithful and true riding on a horse, making war against the kings of the earth, the beast, and the false prophet. This precedes the scene of the great white throne when the small and great stand to be judged individually. Revelation 20 verses 11 and 12 sums up these two judgments, showing that the systems of earth, earth and heaven, flee from Christ's presence, are judged first before the dead, small and great, stand before the great white throne. In reprint 2800, Brother Russell distinguishes between general and individual blessings of the millennium. He notes two conditions which have to be met before the individual's blessings can begin. Quoting reprint 2800, not until the times of the Gentiles expire and not until the fullness from the Gentiles have come can the individual blessings of the millennium be expected and then to the Jew first. Whatever of millennial work precedes that time is general pertaining to the nations and systems. Going to the next slide. Many scriptures speak of the gathering of nations preparatory to the Lord's anger poured out upon them. Brother Cunningham previously addressed Zephaniah 3, 8, and 9. Another text on this point is Isaiah 34, 1 and 2, quoting, Come near nations to hear, and you people listen. Let the earth hear in its fullness, the world and its offspring. For the anger of Jehovah is on all nations, and his fury on all their armies. The time since our Lord's return has been the greatest time of the gathering of the nations in all kinds of international arrangements, the United Nations being the most obvious example. All of this gathering is a sign that the irrepressible conflict is near its final point. Here we have a picture of nine divine right monarchs gathered in 1910 for the funeral of one of their peers. I share this picture to indicate how much the world has changed since World War I began in 1914. Prior to that time, European divine right monarchies were the strongest in the world. The Christian nations in 1914 controlled 80% of the world's people, including their colonies. Christ's eviction of the Gentiles first destroyed these monarchical governments. Daniel spoke of the beginning of the Gentile eviction in Daniel 2, 34 and 44. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. The feet and toes of the image represent the European powers whose eviction began in 1914. Daniel's explanation is given in Daniel 2.44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for other people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Daniel 2.35 provides further detail on the smiting the image. The image not only strikes, excuse me, the stone not only strikes the image, but crushes it into pieces so small the summer wind can carry all of it away into oblivion. 
Verse 35 explains the continuation of the Gentile eviction until all of earth's institutions are removed. Then was the iron, quoting Daniel 2.35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel 2.45 explains this further. We will leave that quote, to, dear friends, for you to, to look into. The prophet Joel says a great deal about this irrepressible conflict. Quoting Joel 3, 11 through 13, gather yourselves and come, all you nations, gather yourselves together all around, cause your mighty ones to come down here, O Jehovah, there, O Jehovah. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the nations all around. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, Come down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Joel refers to the gathering of the nations and specifically to their mighty ones, the leaders who bear great responsibility for the course of their nations. The Valley of Jehoshaphat is the Valley of Judgment, Decision, and Death. Note that Joel prophesies of a harvest that the fruitage, the national fruitage of the nations has come to a full, a full wickedness. This harvest is a destruction of the false fruitage and the selfish institutions that produce this fruitage. Jeremiah speaks of a time when evil would go forth from nation to nation. Jeremiah 25, 30 and 32, quoting, Therefore you shall prophesy against them all these words, and you shall say to them, The Lord will roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his fold. He will shout like those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 31. A clamor has come to the end of the earth, because the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He is entering into judgment with all flesh. As for the wicked, he has given them to the sword, declares the Lord. Verse 32, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, evil is going forth from nation to nation, and a great storm is being stirred up from the remotest parts of the earth. These evils include conflict among nations, but also various calamities such as the world recently experienced with the coronavirus. The picture here is of, is of an early isolation ward in China where the coronavirus outbreak began. The coronavirus outbreak was much like the Spanish flu pandemic that circled the world after World War I. And dear translators, adding a comment here, the conditions universal is shown by the coronavirus pandemic. Everyone across the world was affected. Everyone was considering what was happening. Would I get sick? Would I die? It is amazing how the Lord has gathered the nations to consider just this one thing. Of course, more lessons are coming. The picture on screen is of an Egyptian riot in 2011 during the Arab Spring, an uprising of many people in North African and Middle Eastern nations against corrupt and oppressive governments. A Tunisian street vendor harassed by authorities for money over many years finally burned himself to death to protest the corrupt Tunisian government. Protests in that country overturned the government 
and gave hope to many other peoples that their governments could be overthrown as well. This is an example of evil going forth from one nation to another. Most of the Arab governments severely fought the uprisings. Civil wars in Syria, Libya, and Yemen started then and still continue. Similarly, after World War II, colonial revolutions spread rapidly across Africa and Asia, throwing off European government rule and giving opportunity for native peoples to try to have better government. Financial collapse and downturns are another evil that has gone forth from nation to nation. In the late 1990s, I first saw on the news large downturn in stock markets worldwide on the very same day. While the Great Depression of the 1920s and 30s took many years to develop or to cross the world, Today, economic downturns can be felt immediately across the world. Quoting page 14 in the fourth volume, the approaching trouble is inevitable. The powerful causes are all at work. No human power is able to arrest their operation and progress toward the certain end. The effects must follow as the Lord foresaw and foretold. Brother Russell observed the trends for selfishness and pride in his day and recognized that human society, because of sin, would eventually die. Just as every human being dies as a result of inheriting Adamic sin, so humanity eventually would perish as well without God's intervention. Quoting 2 Timothy 3, 5, Know this also, that in the last days grievous times will be at hand, for men will be lovers, self-lovers, money lovers, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, unyielding, false accusers, without self-control, savage despisers of good, traitors, reckless, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of it, even turn away from these. Commenting again here, Brother Russell observed that Paul's words to Timothy spoke of the complete wreck of human society at the end of mankind's experience with sin, the complete wreck of human society. Luke 21, 25 tells us, upon the earth there would be dismay among nations and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Commenting again, the people of earth are fearful. They see the trends. They see society coming to pieces. Certainly, we see it here in the United States. Returning to the slides. Brother Russell continued his observation of the trend of selfishness to destruction, noting here on page 14 that no hand but the hand of God could stay the progress of the present current events, and his hand will not do so until the bitter experiences of this conflict shall have sealed their instruction upon the hearts of men. God's purpose in permitting the final trouble <clears throat> on mankind is the same as his purpose in allowing Adam to sin the knowledge of the exceeding sinfulness and destructiveness of sin. When the contrasting lesson of the beauty and brilliancy of righteousness is learned, then mankind will realize the great gift that God has given to see evil in all its ugliness. Truly, man's extremity is God's opportunity. 
What does the irrepressible conflict have to do with the highway of holiness? Quoting Isaiah 35, 8, 9. And a highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon, but the redeemed shall walk there. Again, what does the irrepressible conflict have to do with the highway of holiness? Isaiah 62.10 provides the answer. Go through, go through the gates. Prepare the way of the people. Build up, build up the highway. Clear it of stones. Lift an ensign over the peoples. Note how Isaiah in this verse tells that there must be a preparation for the highway. The highway has to be cast up the stumbling stones all removed. This is another way of saying that the systems of man must be judged and removed. Isaiah 40 verse 3 speaks of the preparation of the highway, stating, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Speaking of this irrepressible conflict in Hebrews 12, 26 to 29, Paul taught that everything that can be shaken will be shaken, and the shaking means the removal of those things that are not of God's kingdom. This is another way of saying, excuse me, that all the obstacles to Christ's rule will be removed, including Satan being locked in the pit for the thousand years and the removal of all his institutions of control over mankind. Then when all the preparation have been made and mankind has been prepared, the highway of holiness will be opened. We mentioned earlier that God's general purpose in this irrepressible conflict is to end Satan's rule and introduce Christ's kingdom. We can add that specifically, relative to man, that purpose is to destroy pride. Isaiah speaks of this in chapter 2, verse 17. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Isaiah 13, 12 adds, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. The mightiest rulers, the most oppressive, furthest from the people, are the ones on whom the judgments fall the hardest. Remember, every mountain and hill is to be made low and the valley exalted. In many places in the world today, a man's life is not worth much, but in short order, this will all be changed. Going to the next slide. Job confirms God's purpose in removing pride from the human heart. This is in Job 33, verses 14, 16, and 17. For God speaks once, yea, twice, yet man perceives it not. Then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. God has spoken to mankind twice, once in the giving of the law to Israel, but also in the giving of the gospel to the church. Mankind has not learned the true humility before their creator. So God speaks a third time, opening the ears of men. Brother Russell comments that this third speaking is in the thundertones of the time of trouble. The irrepressible conflict seals its lesson upon the hearts of men that the prideful, selfish, sinful way leads only to death. Various scriptures refer to God speaking to the nations at the end of this conflict, quoting Joel 3.16, 
the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And from Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And 1 Kings 19.12 speaks of a still small voice that is after the wind, earthquake, and fire. God's voice changes as mankind gives him attention. That voice at the end speaks peace to the nations. Zechariah 9 verse 10 is another example. It is the still small voice that calls men to return to Eden. Jeremiah 23, 18 to 20. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, ye shall consider it perfectly. The prophet Malachi describes the evil of fallen man and his attitude toward God in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, quoting, Ye have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? Now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Malachi goes on in verses 16 and 17, to describe the Lord's people, noting their reverence for God, and describing the Christ as the jewels that belong to God. When these jewels are fully prepared, then Malachi returns to the issue of the wicked in verse 18, quoting verse 18. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So it is after the church is complete and after the final conflict is over that mankind considers fully this lesson of the permission of evil and recognizes the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between proper servants, service and reverence to God, to selfishness and pride. Going to the next slide. Why was the conflict irrepressible prophesied? Quoting verse, or excuse me, page 13 in the fourth volume. It is not our purpose in calling attention to this subject to arouse a mere sensation or to seek to gratify idle curiosity, nor can we hope to produce that penitence in the hearts of men which would work a change in the present social, political, and religious order of society, and thus avert the impending calamity. The main object of the fourth volume is not, therefore, to enlighten the world, which can appreciate only the logic of events, but they have no other enlightenment during the trouble. Continuing with the quote, the main object of this volume is to forewarn, forearm, comfort, encourage, and strengthen the household of faith, so that they may not be dismayed, but may be in full harmony and sympathy with even the severest measures of divine discipline in the chastening of the world, seeing by faith the glorious outcome and the precious fruits of righteousness and enduring peace. First Corinthians, excuse me, First Thessalonians 5 verse 4. But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Adding a comment here. 
our Father is so kind, brethren, that we are not left to question with the world why these troubles are happening today. But we have an explanation, and that explanation includes the glorious outcome. We'd like to quote here Revelation 15, verses 1 through 3. We quote this because it shows how the faithful of the church are in harmony with God's judgment. Revelation 15, verses 1 through 3. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels with the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God. Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Commenting again. Here we see the wrath of God poured out in the plagues, and the attitude of the church is that God's works are great and marvelous, but also that his ways are just and true. His vengeance, his correction of the systems of the earth are necessary. And though individuals suffer in the troubles today, the blessings of the kingdom will far outweigh whatever experience the world of mankind has in the earth today. Just closing with Psalm 76, verses 8 through 10. You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment to save the meek of the earth, surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remainder of wrath you shall restrain. And commenting, dear friends, Meditate on this point, that in the end, when we look to the future in the kingdom, and especially to the end of the Christ's work restoring mankind, think of the praise that man will give to God because of what they experienced in this trouble. This is what the scripture says, that in the end, mankind will praise God for what he permitted them to endure because they will see the beauty of righteousness as the result. And the last part of this, I think we often think about, God will not permit anything that will hurt the eternal interests of mankind. May the Lord forgive anything misspoken. And again, we are thankful to be here with you, dear friends, and hope that these things are helpful to, to your considerations. Now back over to you, Brother Edward.